Everyone knows his face, but who knows his story? In life, he was a handsome and noble character, but his last moments were spent in sickness and starvation, barefoot and filthy, being put to death in the most brutal way. Despite a life spent fighting perceived injustice, his aims would never be fully realized in any of his multiple theaters of conflict. The execution of Che Guevara in the remote Bolivian village of La Higuera was a brutal end to a life that had inspired millions to rise against oppression. Far from the ceremonious battle death that some might envision for such a figure, Che's execution was a clandestine, grim affair, carried out by Bolivian soldiers under the shadow of CIA guidance. It was a moment shrouded in secrecy, confusion, and cold political calculus. Che Guevara, an Argentinian socialist revolutionary, spent his entire adult life fighting for his cause and was, in his day, one of the most famous men in the world. Governments the world over either wanted to meet him or capture and kill him. America and the CIA specifically wanted Guevara and were willing to play dirty to get their hands on him. In 1966, the CIA would find exactly what they were looking for. Che Guevara traveled to Bolivia to aid and inspire revolution within the country, something Cuba was doing worldwide, especially in Africa. Aware he was a very wanted man, he shaved his beard and dyed and trimmed his hair in order to disguise his identity. He traveled from Uruguay to La Paz in Bolivia, arriving on the 3rd of November under the assumed name of Adolfo Gonzalez. Within days, Che had departed for the remote region of Nyankawathu, where he planned to create and train his revolutionary guerrilla army. By early 1967, Che had a small force of around 50 men, or FOCO, as Guevara called the small unit of guerrillas, who were well armed with modern equipment from Cuba. He had expected widespread support from local peasants and political dissidents, such as the Bolivian Communist Party, but he received very little assistance from either. He and his men had learned the wrong language, Quechua, and so could not communicate with the locals. Despite this, the Ejercito de Liberación Nacional de Bolivia, or ELN, had a small number of early victories against the Bolivian army. Working for the guerrillas was Tamara Bunke, an East German communist spy. Under the false name of Laura Bauer, she assumed the disguise of an Argentinian folklore expert. Bunke successfully infiltrated the highest rungs of Bolivian high society, even going so far as to go on holiday with the Bolivian president, René Barrientos. She provided the guerrillas with valuable information, but her cover would be blown when her car was discovered at a rebel safe house after a captured guerrilla revealed its location to Bolivian forces. She was forced to flee and went to the jungle to take up arms alongside Che and his guerrillas. As their only contact with the outside world and only source of intelligence, losing Bunke's valuable information meant they were now totally isolated. By mid-1967, the rebels were being hunted down by Bolivian special forces. The guerrillas were unable to contact Havana, as the radios were faulty. Locals were reluctant to help, and Bolivian forces were being advised, trained, and equipped by the CIA and U.S. Rangers, something which Che was unaware of. The local peasants had no sympathy at all, and often reported the guerrilla movements to the army and police. Guevara even wrote in his diary, Talking to these peasants is like talking to statues. They do not give us any help. Worse still, many of them are turning into informants. The group was hunted through the jungle like animals, constantly on the move. There were extreme shortages of food, medicine, and ammunition, and the guerrillas were demoralized, sick, and hungry. In August, a small contingent of guerrillas, including Tamaro Bunke, set off from the main group. They were led by a local peasant, who showed them the best place to cross the river. However, this peasant betrayed them and they were wiped out by waiting soldiers. This attack, combined with multiple desertions from men too sick and tired to fight, meant that Guevara's gang of rebels numbered only 22 hungry, exhausted men. Che's dream of a Bolivian people's uprising had been reduced to less than two dozen men, with little ammunition or energy, being chased through the woods by their would-be captors, fighting against the combined might of the Bolivian army and the CIA Special Activities Division. The men had only six blankets between them. Many were without proper footwear, and they had little access to fresh water. Guevara himself was increasingly sick and was suffering ever-worsening asthma attacks. Many of the guerrillas' final actions were carried out to obtain vital medicine and food. 
the end of Che Guevara. The beginning of the end came when the Bolivian army surrounded the guerrillas, encircling their general area. The soldiers slowly worked their way through the landscape, closing in around the guerrillas as they went. Canyons and deep ravines slowed the army's progress, but with Che and his men surrounded, there was no chance of his escape, and so time was immaterial. His war had come to an end, though whether with a bang or a whimper was yet to be seen. On the 7th of October, after months on the run, a local informed the Bolivian special forces of Guevara's position, directing them to his encampment in the Euro Ravine. The following day, the camp was surrounded by 180 men, and a firefight broke out. Most of the guerrillas would fall, including Che's two Cuban bodyguards, Antonio and Pancho. After hours of intense fighting, Che Guevara was wounded, with his gun also being damaged and rendered useless. As soldiers approached him, he cried out, Don't shoot! I am Che Guevara, and I am worth more to you alive than dead. He was restrained and taken to the nearby village of La Higuera, where he was held hostage in an old, worn-down schoolhouse. Guevara had been shot through the calf. His clothes were shredded, his hair was tangled with mud and dirt, and he wore on his feet strips of leather, his shoes having decayed from the months of fighting and traveling through the jungle. Despite his haggard looks and bad health, one of his interrogators said he held his head high, looked everyone straight in the eyes, and asked only for something to smoke. Three officers attempted to interrogate Guevara, but he refused to talk to any of them, only speaking with the Bolivian soldiers. By the following day, the 9th of October, President Barrientos had given the order for his execution. The execution would be carried out by one, Sergeant Mario Terán, who had lost multiple friends to Che's band of rebels. The Americans had wished to take Guevara to Panama for interrogation, but the Bolivians wanted him dead as soon as possible. They feared that the longer Che Guevara was held captive, the more likely it was that he would be rescued and allowed to restart his insurrection. The decision was made to execute him, but in such a way that it looked like he had received his wounds in combat. Half an hour before his execution, there was one last attempt to interrogate him, to find the whereabouts of the remaining guerrillas. Guevara remained silent, as he had before, refusing to answer any questions. He was led outside of the small hut, where his picture was taken alongside two Bolivian soldiers. This would be the last image ever taken of Che Guevara, only minutes before his death. Tehran entered the small hut, armed with an M2 carbine. Guevara stood up, shouting, I know you've come to kill me. Shoot, coward. You are only going to kill a man. Those words would be his last, as Tehran unloaded his weapon, hitting Guevara in the arms and legs. He was severely wounded, but alive. He lay on the ground, biting hard on his wrist to prevent himself from crying out. Tehran fires another burst, hitting Guevara multiple times, killing him. He had suffered nine gunshot wounds, five to the legs, and once each to his arm, leg, chest, and throat. Che Guevara was dead. His corpse was strapped to the landing skids of a Bolivian army helicopter and flown to the town of Valle Grande. Soldiers waited to collect the body, along with thousands of locals hoping to catch a glimpse of the world-famous revolutionary. The crowd swarmed the helicopter as it touched down, until the waiting soldiers pointed their guns at them, convincing them to stay back. The body was put into a waiting car and transported to the local hospital, where he was formally identified. The army's false story of Che being mortally wounded in battle did not last. General Ovando claimed he had been captured on Sunday, dying of his wounds on Monday. The attending doctors insisted otherwise, the post-mortem revealing he had died only five or six hours prior to his arrival at Valle Grande, from bullets to the heart and lungs. America had wanted to take Guevara into their custody to be interrogated and held captive in Panama. Despite this, while the American National Security Advisor believed that the decision to kill Guevara was stupid, he also said it was understandable from a Bolivian standpoint. The reaction within Bolivia was immediate and intense. Those who saw his body considered him to be a Christ-like figure who sacrificed himself so that others may live. At the same time, the various media outlets fought tooth and nail for the right to publish his diary. Unbeknownst to anyone, the Minister for Internal Affairs was in fact a secret Cuban sympathizer and so mailed a copy of the diary to Havana, so the Cubans could be the first to publish Guevara's diary. The discovery that President Barrientos had in his cabinet a communist sympathizer was a shock to the public and an embarrassment to the government. 
violent protests broke out in response, and the government was almost ready to crumble. Ironically, this was the closest Guevara ever came to realizing his aims in Bolivia. The CIA and the U.S. Department of State knew all too well the power and influence of Che Guevara, or at least the image of him, and how he was viewed by many as the patron saint of revolution and the downtrodden. They knew his death would be seen as martyrdom, and that other leftist groups the world over would mourn his death. His bloody execution would turn him into the global face of revolution and rebellion. Guerrillero Heroico Che Guevara's end goal for his Cuban revolution was to create a state without business and without money. In stark contrast to this ideal, his image would become part of a popular consumer culture, with everything from cigarette rolling trays or makeup mirrors to mugs and shoes bearing his image. In 2007, a lock of his hair, harvested as he lay in state in the town of Valle Grande, would sell at auction for almost $120,000. A final insult, going against everything he had believed in and fought for, some 40 years after his death in the jungles of Bolivia.